<laughs> How does it feel to be here at the London MCM Comic Con? You enjoyed meeting fans here, taking part in stuff like this. Oh, awesome. yeah, for We came sure. last year and had so much fun and met so many kind of amazing fans. And, um, you know, I think you lose sight of, uh, like, who the show reaches out to when all you do is shoot it. We shoot for 10 months out of the year. And coming last year, I think, was really special because we got to meet so many fans from all over the world who um, the show really has an impact kind of on, on their lives and them, you know, inviting us into their homes for a hundred and... 85 episodes and kind of the, the role the show plays in the family dynamic and watching it together I think that was a really special thing for for both of us yeah and also it's interesting too because I ah oh, you got it <laughs> <laughs> all right now we can switch. for those who couldn't see no no I'm okay I'm okay you're such a gentleman um for those of you who uh, <laughs> didn't see what just happened we've been complaining about a drip of water in the ceiling and now one just fell on me um <laughs> we're melting oh. um <laughs> all part of my master uh, plan <laughs> So the in Europe, um, the generation I feel like the generations that watch us are a little bit different than in the U.S. I think we have a little bit of a more mature following in the U.S. versus here, which is a younger following. So it's interesting to see the difference in dynamic and the people that come to Comic Con. Um, there are lots of people that fly from different countries to come and see us, and I mean I think the whole organization is is so impressive. There was a hundred over one hundred thirty thousand people last year in two days. Um, it's just incredible. And to be able to, you know, it's actually really difficult because people pay to be here and they fly in to see you and you want to give everybody enough time to be like, hi, what's your name? What brings you here? And it's difficult when you have a, a whole line of people and they're kind of like, you got to go. Otherwise, you're not going to get through everybody who's, you know, paid for a ticket. And um, yeah, I love it. I love meeting the fans face to face. It's it's the only opportunity we have is things like this. So. As part of your characters on NCIS, um, how much do you get to input into the characters and the skills that they have? Hold on. <laughs> the skills How much that do you, you put into the words of your character. You mean dialogue wise or character wise? Uh, character wise, dialogue wise. Well, Either. I mean, for, for example, you, you have an episode where you go undercover dancing, which right. is a personal skill of yours that you yeah. managed to introduce. Um, Did you have input on that? It just fell on my nose. <laughs> <laughs> this is so great. It's like the best interview ever. Just the whole time, it's just you waiting to say something like interesting, and then just water dripping. Um, Did so you have input? Did you ask for that? No, Dancing? no, no, no. I, I, I didn't ask for that. Actually, sometimes the writers like, "What do you think we would like to do?" Actually, our um, showrunner sent us an email yeah. saying, "Like, if there's anything that you guys would like to do in the next season that you haven't done already." Um, I can never think of anything. I'm just always happy when they add little um, fun things to do, such as the dancing. So yes, it was a skill that I already had. So um, I not not in salsa dancing though, but um, yeah, it was it was just really fun to do. It was actually supposed to be done earlier in the season, but because I was pregnant, um, I wasn't able to do it. And I thought that they would just have another character do it. So I was really sad that I <laughs> might not be able to have get another dance. character dance. Yeah, they could have put Nell in uh, because she's uh, actually yeah. also a dancer. She has a dance background as well. I mean, they could have had anybody else in that in, in that role. Anybody but me. You kind of did dance <laughs> in that episode Not too. Not really. It kind of flopped around like a Muppet. It's <laughs> <laughs> dancing as much as it's just graceful. Flopping. Eric has one signature go-to move. That move is good though. <laughs> uh, as far as input goes, I think that you know part of it is that after 185 episodes, they have an idea of what our strengths are. And so I think you've seen the evolution of the banter between, you know, Kenzie and Deeks. Um, they definitely write to the comedic elements that, that we bring to the show. Um, and they're also very open about finding things in the moment, which is that you do one per scripted as the dialogue written, and then you can try stuff. And some of my favorite kind of reactions and moments in the show are, are moments in which they weren't really, moments in which they weren't, um, it wasn't on the page. One of my favorite scenes still, forever, is after Deeks is tortured and he's going through a period where he's not able to sleep for weeks and she comes over with Chinese food and it's mm. this great scene that they played in a two shot where there's a bunch of like really honest, natural improvis improvisation um, and, uh, and it ended up being one of my, my favorite scenes um, because you find moments that, that, that aren't prepared for and her reactions, she's so good at reacting to those moments. That Especially when he's off camera and says things that he knows will get a reaction off of me which are un unsayable at this time. <laughs> yeah. But here's the cool thing too, is because I think that Eric and I have created a certain dynamic over the last seven years, um, <clears throat> sometimes they'll leave, the, because what it is for those who don't know, it's 
um, you know, a camera on him, a camera on me, and it's behind us and everything. But when you have certain moments like this one that he's talking about, or during the proposal when Kenzie's in a wheelchair, um, sometimes you kind of have to have a camera on both of us simultaneously because the things that you get in the moment are going to be different every single take. One might take you to a, you know, a more emotional place, a more a quieter place, whatever it is. And so to get the, the matching reaction from the other person, you have to ensure that there's a camera on both of you, otherwise you have sort of mismatched takes between us. Um, and so, you know, we always know when there's a camera either on both of us or at the same time on each one of us, we always know that that's a moment that him and I get to play more around with because it's gonna cut nicely in editing whenever they do that. So, um, and about the input too, there's, oh, 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 that time <clears throat> where uh, Kenzie's in recovery in season eight. Hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she can't walk and she's going through times where she's depressed, sad, angry, but it's all very negative feelings. And so between us and the director, um, we kind of felt like we needed a relief from that, something a little bit sweeter between them to, to show the sort of roller coaster that it is to recover from something uh, like what she was going through. And so we asked our... Uh, Scott Gemmel, who's our showrunner and one of our writers, and he wrote my whole arc throughout the recovery, and we said, hey, do you think we can get something a little sweet? And so literally, over lunchtime, he wrote a scene, and we shot it that day, mm -hmm. um, and it just fits so beautifully, and if, for those who've watched it, it's the scene where they wake up um, in the hospital, and, and she's like, I don't want to be here anymore, and he's like, I know, but you have to, and it's just a sweet moment before everything crashes again. Um, and that was written on the day, and shot literally a few hours after he wrote it, so yeah, so there is a degree of input on our part with what happens, um, and I think the trust that the writers and showrunners show in us, we all know the characters so well now, so I think it's important to have a, a dialogue with what happens. That's really a tribute too to, you know, we have a first day to use guy, Eric Pott, who's so good. Uh, this, one of our executive producers, JPK, was directing that episode. Scott Gemmel was our showrunner and also the writer for these whole sequences. You know, having that discussion, saying, here's our fear, we don't have a moment to emotionally connect to the, the, the beauty of this. You know, obviously it's this tumultuous recovery, but we need a moment of, of not brevity, but a, a reason to fight for these two. Um, and then to go off and do that over a lunch, come back and trust to shoot it, um, is remarkable. Especially on a show that's such a well-oiled machine that we you know we're in season eight, for them to go, all right, let's adapt, go try this. Is I don't know if I've ever been a part of a project that, that was able to kind of on the fly, make those kind of changes, which is, which is amazing. And a tribute to, to those guys, to Gemmel and JPK and Eric Pott. What's your act? What is your acting technique? Do you do? Because you said about repetition and like I was thinking of minds now. How are you, like your banter and stuff? How what what do you do? What, what's your acting technique and how do you apply it to your characters? Um, I. I can tell you that I studied something specific, mm. but I can also tell you that regardless of what that specific mm. thing is, what I learn most is I don't need a technique unless I need help for any reason in the moment. Because other, if you listen, if you act and react, you're yeah. going to be in the moment and be in the reality of it regardless of what the technique is that you've learned or not learned. It uh, doesn't matter if you come from a Shakespeare background or not. If I'm listening genuinely to what he's saying to me in the scene and I react appropriately, you have a real moment. Yeah. Um, so since we're playing real human beings in, you know, supposedly real situations, that's all we can do. And I think it also... The repetition is like the take. Yeah. It's not so much repetition like going back and forth with the word and then, you know... Yeah, we usually read, it, read it once before we do it on camera. Um, uh, I think that also plays into finding moments because if she's just listening and reacting, when I change, she has to adapt. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get you know, these different variances of takes. Otherwise, and there's people that do, you know, everybody's got their own kind of method. Mine was from William H. Macy. One of my first movies ever was, he was in, and he said, um, acting is just listening and then telling the truth. And the only time I stop myself, and she sees it, you know, when I'm in a take, where I'm like, that, that, was, that was bullshit, but like, I wasn't telling the truth. And I just go back and pick it up until it's the truth. And whatever version of where that character is in his head, you know, even the bad guys tell the truth um, yeah. in their own minds. So uh, bad guys don't think they're bad guys. Right. They think they're doing the best for whatever their intentions or objectives are. So they're still telling the truth. Yeah. So no matter what the character is, he's still telling his own version of the truth. Like you do a big broad comedy. Like this is the best example of how this works. Like Dumb and Dumber. I did the prequel to that, which is a terrible, you know, broad comedy. <laughs> 
but in the mind of Lloyd, who's the Jim character, Jim Carrey character, he's still telling the truth. Like that's just his viewpoint on the world. And what makes it so funny is he's so committed to being wrong about the world, but that's the way he sees it, right? And that, that commitment is why you can emotionally connect and go, all right, I'm gonna make this ridiculous journey with this character because this is how he views the world. And it's funny to me because he's so wrong, but also so committed. It's kind of like, Bob, I can say that. Are you going to plug another one of you? No, I was going to just or? talk about politics, but that was a mistake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we were all thinking you're so wrong with the view of the world, but you're so committed to it. It becomes a parody <laughs> hint, hint. of <laughs> so, logic. Um, wondering, so how big is the um, universe that NCIS um, and the rest of inhabit? You can just see um, Kenzie head over to Y50. Um, we've seen Hetty visit um, Scorpion, yeah. and then we've seen um, that's MacGyver on Hawaii Five O. So, how big is it? And it's as big as CBS. <laughs> <laughs> and are you planning um, any major uh, crossover of the basement in terms of between the other NGS? You forgot Michael came to our show as well. Yeah, Michael well, literally came to our show. Yeah, I was just, well, I was just about to say that in the past, we've had course if it's generally just one um, or two cast members of one day yeah. so you can get, say, what the Hourglass does and has one two episodes where all, like, an entire team goes over somewhere else. I we're think it's very deep, sorry. No, we're still exploring <laughs> the possibility of that. I think yeah. there's a good chance in the next couple of seasons to do an NCIS LA, yeah. NCIS, you know, that kind of the episode that we all kind of wanted to, which I is think the joining the, it. Yeah, but the major thing, I think, is probably scheduling-wise, because it's so tough mm -hmm. to schedule. I mean, there's seven regulars on our show, and there's probably seven or eight on their show as well. So to, to coordinate, you know, 16 actors on two different shows, one's on Sunday, one's on Tuesday in the U.S., um, it, I think it's more so than anything else, it's a logistical thing, because then you also have two showrunners and two, you know two line producers and everybody's trying to coordinate all these things um so yeah but i agree with eric i think i think it's just a matter of time until we do something really cool like that i'm awesome. gonna go do big bang i'm gonna bring deeks to the big bang theory <laughs> maybe deeks goes to mom does a couple episodes of mom is that a show over here they have mom over here yeah, yeah. that's funny show. it's been running for so long if it did end god forbid how would you like to see both your characters stories wrapped up I've never gotten that question before. Good question. Oof. You know, I, I think both of these characters, I can talk about Deeks. Um, I think for Deeks, uh, his journey has been one in which he's searching for, I think, the, the, the love that he never got from his dad. Um, and I think he has an interesting relationship with his mom I think that Hetty has played almost a mother figure to Deeks in helping him kind of figure out who he is. I think the most kind of self-actualization or definition of character has come with the relationship with Kenzie. And so I think that you know the obstacles that they've given to these two characters and how that has evolved that relationship, I can't see any other ending for Deeks to find happiness but somewhere within that. Yeah, um, in uh, just to sort of uh, give you a shorter answer, but very similar to Eric, I think Kenzie is looking for someone to call home. Um, she has, she, she ran away from home when she was really young. She was really close to her dad. You guys watched the show, and then obviously he was murdered. Um, and, uh, and she ran away from home because she never had much of a relationship with her mom. Um, I don't think her mom was a bad person or anything. I think they, they just didn't connect on any level. Um, and so it's this... Oh, and plus for Kenzie, every man in her life has been killed. It was her dad, it was uh, Dom, her first partner, who was kidnapped and killed, and um, now Granger. And so there's this fear of proximity with another human being, but at the same time it's this desperation to try and call, to want to call someone home, no matter where she is. And, uh, and I think that considering all the obstacles that these two have been through together, both them going through it and the other one being a support system and vice versa, um, you know, they've, they've, she's found home with Deeks, there's no doubt, and I think it would be really, really unfair if they didn't end up together happily married with children or something. Um, just another drop. Um, <laughs> in the end, it wouldn't be fair if they didn't end up together, I think. But life isn't fair, so who knows? Mm -hmm. Next. Anybody else? I feel like we talk so much, right? 
Huh? I'm so glad you brought that up. Oh, great. Yeah. Open those floodgates. of comedic actors. There were so many performers in that movie, and honestly, it's the better of <coughs> Jim Carrey sequels without Jim Carrey. Uh, it's certainly better than some of the masks and better than Ace Ventura Jr. Um, how was it working on that movie with so much comedic talent? By the way, can I just say something from an objective perspective? Can you even tell that Eric wasn't Jim Carrey at some point? I forgot that it wasn't Jim Carrey. I really did. <laughs> I saw it in theaters, so... Jesus, I owe you $13. <laughs> <laughs> also, by, the, by the way, I was a little freaked out, so I'm married to his brother, and so um, I, we were visiting his parents, and I went down to the basement, and there was this life-size poster of him as Lloyd, like this, and I'm <laughs> just walking on the street, so it's like, oh, my mom stole, just, my like, mom stole it from a theater. <laughs> <laughs> it just, I, she actually didn't steal it. She asked if she could have it, and then they gave it to her. GDB but the idea steal. of my mom, who's this wonderful Midwest non-denominational chaplain, like running out of the theater, stealing a cardboard cutout of me, makes me laugh so hard. <laughs> um, listen, I think that it's so... This is why we're all here, is it's so hard to make good entertainment. I mean, all it takes is one person to screw up and the whole thing falls apart. Um, and I think that is an example, that movie is impossible to live up to because Dumb and Dumber is one of the greatest buddy comedies in the history of, of cinema. Like that movie holds up. You watch it and you go, my God, Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels are pitch perfect. You love them, you root for them. I think it's a definition, of, as we talked about before, of a character whose perspective on the world is so strong that you're like, this is absurd. And there's a moment when he's humanized when Jim Carrey says, I'm sick of being a nobody, and I'm sick of having nobody. Oh, and then, the, and then in, in that moment, you're like, these ridiculous cartoon characters, I sympathize. These are universal themes, and we're with you. And for the rest of the movie, you, you go down this rabbit hole of nonsense. Um, so I think we, I see, when they said they're making this movie, I was like, this is the worst idea I've ever heard. And then I booked the movie, and I was like, yes! And then I go, oh my god, this is still the worst idea ever made. Um, and I felt like, you know, throughout that whole movie, all I wanted to do was make him happy. It's just, just do justice to what he did because I grew up such a fan of his. Um, and then I remember watching, you know, some late night show where they asked him about it. And it's like, I, you know, all I see is the pigs. At, I, I'm so remembering this moment. All I can see is the pigs at the trough of, the, of my hard work or something. And I felt like, oh my God, I'm so heartbroken. But then his manager came up to me at a party like, a couple months after the movie came out and said something like uh, that Jim had seen the movie and at some point in time he stopped forgetting that it wasn't him. And that for me was like, you know, I slept for the first time in a month. Um, because it was, all I wanted to do is, is, is make that guy happy because he was, you know, and still is, you know, a legend, genius. a genius. Yeah. I think the scene in the, uh, in the house bathroom with Bob Saget screaming about... All over the walls, yeah. yeah. I think that scene on its own made me laugh more than the actual Dumb and Dumber sequel that came out. <laughs> well, I won't touch that one. That's a very nice compliment. That is a very funny scene. That is a very funny scene. Yeah, I mean, that parts of it are really funny. Derek Richardson, who played Harry, is still one of my best friends. And Bob Saget and, we had, you know, Sherry O'Terry. We had, uh, who played the principal? Uh, Eugene Levy. Eugene Levy. Like, we had so much fun making that movie, but we all knew we were doomed. I mean, just, like, you put a target on my back and then just go, go for it, kid, run. <laughs> I'm just, like, ah! just looking back, waiting for the shot to come. Um, it's a guilty pleasure, I still... Yeah, no, I've made a lot of those guilty pleasure movies. <laughs> There's a lot of, before I did the TV show. You owe a lot of people a lot of money. I owe a lot of people a lot of money. <laughs> like Beer Fest and Fired Up and none of their TV Fired movie. Up is really funny. Fired, Fired, Fired Up is really actually, Fired Up is actually really funny. That's a, that's a funny movie. That was really fun to make. One of the greatest things about you is you have the capacity of having chemistry with almost everybody that you act beside. Oh, that's not not a lot of people a really have nice that. Really nice compliment. That's I'll true take though. It. He, he's he's a adapt man here. If you were super here, you'd be adapt man. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. What's adapt like adapt? You adapt to any situation. Adapt to every person. So adapt man. So it's, it's a noun and a verb. And an adjective. Sure. <laughs> She's not sure. I was like, wait. Um, How do you think that NCIS has changed your lives? Well, I mean, hers like, is really I've, simple. <laughs> it's pretty much everything in life has changed. <laughs> well, for what I turned 25 in season one, and now I'm 33. I met my husband. 
I had my child, I got married, I had a second child, I bought my first house, sold that, bought a second house. <laughs> um, and uh, my entire life happened on the show. Yeah, Seriously? <laughs> Free shower with every interview. It's just a little Legionnaire's fungus disease. or something in there. It's totally Legionnaire's disease. It's okay, guys. I'm just getting syphilis over here. Um, <laughs> why is there syphilis? The air <laughs> I didn't put it there. Right? The cast of Riverdale is hanging out upstairs. Are you saying they have syphilis? I have never seen the show. I just thought it'd be really funny. <laughs> I, I have no idea who's on the show. It's just the first name that came to mind. I would have made an OC joke, but those kids got fired. So. <laughs> No, I did it again. Uh, this is why I shouldn't do it every um, uh, Wait, hold on. I have an answer. What was the question? <laughs> stalling. Stalling. Oh, yes, the show. Mm. How has it changed? I, I have a really you interesting perspective on this. Right, but I, but two be, kids. But before that, so I essentially did eight years of, of, of TV and film before the show. And listen, if, you, if you're working, which is the greatest pleasure of all time, you're gone six months out of the year. So I would be shooting in, you know, all over the world. And then you come home and you audition and then you book a movie and you go back to someplace else. It's, it's a really difficult way to have a family. So when I said, uh, when I met Sarah, my wife, and I was like, this is the person I want to be with. I want to raise a family. And I but don't you met on do a show it. together. Which we met on a TV yeah. show together. Um, I want to raise a family. I was like, how do I stay in L.A. and do that? And they were like, there's a show called NCIS LA. And I go, never heard of it. And they're like, it's the number two show on the planet. I was like, what's number one? They said, NCIS LA, or NCIS. I was like, never heard of it. Uh, and I was like, is it comedy? Is it drama? What is it? And they were like, well, actually, they're, they're casting a role for one of the, the, the new leads. His name is Victor Cruz. And he's an East, a LA, East LA Latino street cop. I was like, I'm perfect for it. <laughs> Send me in there. And By so the way, we're supposed to speak fluent Spanish. Yeah, I don't speak fluent anything. I can barely speak English, <laughs> obviously. Um, so I was just like, but this shoots in LA. And I remember the audition scene was like me talking about a motorcycle with Kenzie. And everybody else they had auditioned for this part had a chemistry with her. But they finally no, just no, gave no, up on No, no, I had chemistry them. read with me. Yeah, what did I say? You just said chemistry. Chemistry read with her. So they would bring in and they'd be like, hello, you're so pretty. And then you would say your lines. And they're like, this <laughs> is... nothing like that. <laughs> You're so pretty, apparently they're Russian. The Russian <laughs> East LA Spanish in the East LA. I'm derailing this, this story. Um, this is my life with him on the set. So, so I came in and did my audition, and the, the showrunner, Shane, looked at me and he's like, I feel like there's more you want to try. And I was like, well, we can do two things. We can you know, do the words on the page, or I can kind of figure out the character. And he goes, give it a shot. Do whatever you want to do. And so I made up a monologue, like a full speech in the audition, improv, about her and prior boyfriends and just kind of pinning what this relationship looks like and who she is based on you know the stuff that i had read and he just looked at me after we're done he's like okay okay and they sent that to the studio and the studio was like no but he's supposed to be latino he was supposed to be a latino street cop from east la um but they brought me on board for a couple episodes to see if it worked uh and then i went off and shot the thing instead of finishing the show uh, but they brought me back for the second season and, and that has been life-changing because i get to be in la I get to do drama and comedy, drama, comedy, and the love story, which is kind of what you can, I mean, what's your- And action. Yeah, action, yes. comedy, drama, I get to do it all on the show. And do undercover, you know, characters that are ridiculous. And you so, gained a sister. And I gained a sister-in-law, which is really exciting. <laughs> um, it's been awesome. It's been, a, it's been a wonderful experience. And, um, and all my friends that are off shooting films I don't have any pangs of jealousy for them flying to, you know, Estonia. What's wrong with Estonia? I love Estonia. <laughs> Are you from Estonia? No. I'm not a fan. I get kicked out of Estonia at gunpoint. That's another story for another time. <laughs> what did you just say? You know, I've never heard that story? I don't know that I have. I got kicked out of Estonia with Tayo, my friend oh, I heard from about Nigeria, yes, I put into a windowless van at gunpoint. It's a beautiful country. <laughs> Not a big fire fired up over there in Estonia. <laughs> what? We're done. That's, we're done! That's all you get. Enjoy the Riverdale, kids. Thank you very much.